How am I doing? Thank you. I did not mean this talk, but I meant how am I doing as a teacher? It's, it's a question that I ask myself on a regular basis. You know the thing that I like the most about being an educator? I, I enjoy all the roles that I get to play. You see, when I was, uh, when I was attending a uh, prestigious graduate school, <laughs> uh, which by the way, I've incurred so much loans, uh, you can pray for me, I'll probably die with loans. Uh, but I was an athlete training. And is there a reason why? It, it's OK, no problem. I was studied under great mentors. I was an apprentice, developing my craft. Then I went out on my own. I started teaching. I was, I was an explorer, blazing trails and writing maps based on guile, wit, and intuition. I heard great things, ridiculous things, not so ridiculous things in case my dean or my department chair is in the room. I was getting great feedback. I was hearing uh, wonderful words of encouragement and support. In fact, I was bestowed the highest honor that one could be bestowed upon in higher education. I was given the red chili pepper and rate my professor. So I was basically, in my mind, I was the greatest professor ever. <laughs> then one day, I saw this. And I was thinking, you know, it's really not a big deal. It's just, uh, just one discontented student. And I paid it no mind. Then I saw this a few weeks later. And suddenly, I was the worst professor on the planet and a terrible musician. You know, it, it's interesting. When we're, uh, when we're professors, uh, we tend to see our successes as the product of black magic and sorcery. We're holy conduits, each word uttered coming directly from the mind of God. We're captains, fearlessly leading our students through tr untraversed waters. We're bullfighters, taking on the most pressing issues of our discipline. But when we experience failure, our whole notion about the role that we play as teachers comes into question. How do I improve? How do I know what I'm doing is good? How do I ensure that I have a process in place to continue moving? in the right direction. So I know I needed to make changes, but I wasn't sure how to make those changes. I wasn't sure to what extent I should change or if I was just overreacting based on a few uh, you know, reactions and comments. So I started to study change. I developed what's called a change spectrum, and it's a real thing because I just made it up. <laughs> but uh, as I started to think about these terms, I started to look at this third word, innovation. And I started to think about how this word was different from invention and improvement. You see, I had been inventing and improving things in my classes, but that elusive innovation concept. You see, the thing about innovation that's unique is that innovation is when we apply methods or ideas uh, in a novel way that creates value and addresses an unmet need. So was I doing this in my class? No, actually, as I, as I went to look at all the activities I had my students doing, I realized I was just inventing and improving uh, based on a professional hunch, based on instinct, based on guile and experience. But experience is not really a great teacher. You know, we don't, we don't progress on a line where we move from one experience to the next and we just magically get better. Education is not black magic and sorcery. Education deals with products, consumers, markets. I had to start thinking about what I did in the classroom in tangible terms, in realistic and actionable words. See, while invention deals with solutions, improvement deals with evolution, innovation deals with revolution. So how was I going to get to that revolution in my class? I want to propose to you today five conditions, five things that I think need to be in the pot when we consider innovation in education. First, innovation is going to require people, not technology. Often we think about innovation, we think about a cool piece of technology that we want to integrate, but the reality is that we need to think first about people. The Toyota production system, it's known as the lean manufacturing system. It's studied worldwide, it's famous. And uh, one of the two foundational pillars of TPS is this concept called Jakoda. And what Jakoda is translated to is um, 
automation with the human touch. This means that uh, when the machinery breaks down, uh, it's immediately stopped to prevent it from producing defective products. A human operator then moves in and assesses the problem and makes improvements. So in the classroom, I think this idea applies in a sense that while we may set up certain activities and policies over the course of a semester, we need to remember the human element. We need to uh, be quick to respond to defective outcomes as we see them. Innovation is going to answer a certain spoken or unspoken need. Often we have assumptions about what is it that the students need. You see, Reebok in the late 80s, they were doing research on high school basketball players. And what they realized is that these players had shoes that were too big or too small because they were going through growth spurts. And parents were fed up because they had to buy kicks every couple of months, so it was costing a lot of money. Pro athletes were getting ankle injuries. So here was Reebok's solution. Let's make a shoe with an inflatable air pocket around the ankle. It'll be weight, la weightless, it'll, be, uh, it'll prevent injuries, plus it'll allow the players to pump the content in for themselves, allowing for a certain personalization of the product. The Reebok pumps were born from this thought. And the Reebok pumps were a game changer in athletic footwear because it seeked to address a customer, a problem, with deep level design thinking. So in the same way, if we want to be innovative in our teaching, we need to step back and we need to let go of our assumptions. And we need to really try to understand what is it that students really are looking for in the classroom. Innovation is going to be supported by feedback and data. Uh, Procter & Gamble was looking to make a, a cleaning tool years ago. And they did some research. And in, instead of the research showing that people wanted to clean faster or clean a larger area of space, they actually created a new problem. They realized that what people needed was a cleaning tool that didn't need to be cleaned so much. You see, people were spending as much time cleaning their mops as they were using their mops to clean their floor. They wouldn't have been able to come to this conclusion if they hadn't done some hard research and gathered some data. And what their solution was was this, a long stick with a towel that can be disposed every time it gets soiled. And from that came the Swiffer, whose refills I'm sure you need to buy next week at Target. It's a great product, but it wouldn't have been able to be developed if they didn't ask two questions. What are the current offerings? And what issues are people having with the current offerings? And both of those questions are rooted in a need for feedback. See, our ability to understand our students' needs only go as far as our ability to collect reliable data and feedback from them. Fourth, innovation is going to invite failure. I'm sure you all have seen Post-it notes. Well, Post-it notes were actually developed um, by 3M in the late 60s. You see, there was a chemist who was trying to uh, develop a super adhesive for the aerospace industry. And it actually was a pretty crappy adhesive. It, it didn't. It, it wasn't very strong. But the adhesive had this interesting property. You see, um, the adhesive could stick to things even after being used several times. So this chemist thought, well, hey, maybe I could put this adhesive on a bulletin board, and I can have a board where things stick to it without using tacks or using pins. So he introduced that product to 3M, but ultimately it was rejected. About five years later, another chemist for 3M was having a problem in church. His paper bookmark kept falling out of his choir hymnal. And he thought back to that weak adhesive. And he thought, instead of putting the adhesive on a bulletin board, what if I put that adhesive on a piece of paper? That way, the piece of paper could stick to anything, and it could be used several times. And from there, the post-it was born. So sometimes we see feedback as an obstacle. But really, feedback that's based on Deliberate, but deliberative thought is actually an integral part of innovation. So if we're going to answer these, these, these problems, these questions that students have, we're going to have to invite failure into the process. And last, innovation is going to come at the right time. We've all seen this iPod before. It's one of the great innovations of the 21st century. But did you know the iPod was not the first MP3 player to be, to be released in the market? It actually was released three years after the first MP3 players came out. So what made this product so innovative? You see, Apple was smart. They waited. 
and they waited, and they waited some more. See, Apple realized that the MP3 player was useless on its own. Uh, what was important was for other co-innovators in the MP3 ecosystem to evolve. See, they waited for a software package that could support this great piece of hardware. And they also had to wait for broadband to become widely available so download speeds were fast enough for people to actually use the MP3 players. So because they brought all these things at the right time, and a year after the iPod came out, they opened the iTunes store, a certain legitimacy and a certain access to MP3s was ushered in. And uh, from that, the iPod became the dominant player in the MP3 market. So we see people need feedback, failure, and time. So I've, I've looked at these conditions for innovation, and I try to understand what is it that I can do to apply these into my class. You see, I was looking at my professional feedback from my dean, and those were dealt with, those dealt with inputs. But what I was missing was my students' evaluations. And my students' evaluations didn't just ask questions about inputs, like what knowledge did I have, how was I presenting, but they were asking questions, important questions, like was my learning increased? Was my interest enhanced? Was I challenged? And this question of challenge kept coming up in my student evaluations. Uh, the, the, the top students in my classes were consistently saying that they weren't challenged enough. What I really learned through this process is that students invite challenge. They want to be challenged. As long as you can show them the value, you need to show them the value proposition. And if you do, then they'll be invested and, and they will invite the challenge. So I went back to the drawing board. I decided I needed to uh, design uh, course content that had multiple points of entry, where activity could be given to the class, and even the students that had the most musical ability were able to uh, you know, still be engaged with this topic. I also realized that for some students, my degrees, my accolades, would not give me an authority to teach the subject. They had to see me play. You see, students are afforded so much access so much transparency in every area of their educational lives. Logically, this needs to be extended to them in the classroom. You see, my biggest flaw was in not recognizing the powerful ability of students to know what they really need. So now, I've been not just performing for them like a concert, but I've been, I've been improvising with the students, I've been composing music with them, I've been communicating with them musically on a regular basis. It's, it's not a finished work, it's a work in progress. But what I want to propose to you today is that we stop looking at our progression in education on a line, that instead we start to really consider where our activities in the class, where they lie in the, the change spectrum. And for those activities that invite innovation, I encourage you to think about these five conditions. And I outlined a process that said people need feedback, failure, and time. But really, this process can be seen in either direction. Over time, as failure is detected, we use feedback to address need in a way that positively affects people. So regardless of the words that you'd like to use, I'd like to challenge you to instead of thinking about innovation as a product, that instead we see it as a complex process. Now, these innovative changes aren't going to take place by large companies and educational seminars. They're going to happen. They're going to be initiated by teachers and students, like people like you and me in this room now. So I'm not there yet. It's a work in progress. But through a lot of hard work, through a committed process to develop, a fearlessness to fail, maybe a little prayer, and possibly some black magic, I think I'm going to get there. Thank you.